Hello everyone and welcome back to Echo Asthma Bootcamp. Today we're going to talk about managing injectable medications. My name is Ashley, I'm your facilitator. I'm joined today by my coordinators, Rachel and Tabitha, as well as our wonderful hub team, Dr. Meredith McCormick, Dr. Louis Koritsky, and Andrea Jensen, certified asthma educator. Alrighty, and now let's get started with our final lecture uh, delivered by Dr. Kerr on managing injectable medications. So welcome to session six of the ECHO Asthma program. Today we'll talk about managing injectable medications. My name is Dr. Sucharita Kerr. I'm an assistant professor at Tufts University School of Medicine and an adult pulmonologist at the Tufts Medical Center Pulmonary Clinic. So we've reviewed this before, but there are five FDA-approved biologics for use as add-on treatments for severe asthma. This is for pa when patients' asthma is uncontrolled despite use of high-dose inhaled corticosteroids and another anti-inflammatory therapy such as a leukotriene antagonist. These drugs include omalizumab, mepolizumab, reslizumab, benralizumab, and dupilumab. We have the targets for each of these drugs listed here, as well as the age for administration. The one thing I'd like to highlight here is the dosing interval, as well as the route of administration. And as we're having a shared decision-making conversation with the patient, it's important for us to realize that each of these can bring a different option to the patient. So omalizumab is a drug that's typically administered every two to four weeks. It often requires in-office administration. And because of the small but real risk of anaphylaxis, it requires an EpiPen for administration. It's important to note that uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic, however, there have been some exceptions made that patients may be able to administer omalizumab at home if certain specific criteria are met. Mepolizumab, on the other hand, is administered every four weeks uh, subcutaneously. And again, a self-injection option is available for ages 12 and above. Reslizumab is an IV therapy and so needs to be administered in an infusion center every four weeks and often may take longer than a typical subcutaneous injection. Vendralizumab is administered every eight weeks and can be used subcutaneously. And again, a self-injectable option is available. And similarly for dupilumab, while it's every two weeks, a self-injectable option is available. Going back to benralizumab, it's every eight weeks, only after the first three doses have to be administered every four weeks, and then following that, it's every eight weeks. So when I sit down and have a conversation with my patient about what next, or when I'm starting to have a conversation about this, their symptoms not adequately being controlled or that they're continuing to have exacerbations, and having the shared decision-making visit with the patient about initiation of a biologic next, there are many questions that, that patients ask me. Will the shot work right away? And the answer to that is typically, you know, studies have shown that it takes three to four doses to really achieve optimal control, although biochemically eosinophils may be decreased quite soon after the first shot in some cases. But in, in practical, pragmatically, we often wait to assess efficacy or reassess efficacy at about six months. How will you know if the shot is going to work? Well, I often tell them that we monitor various things. We monitor how they're doing, their symptoms. We monitor if they're having exacerbations. We check eosinophils to ensure that they're low, especially if the patient is on an anti-IF-5 therapy. And we also look at their pulmonary function tests, particularly their FEV1. Patients ask, what if the drug does not work? And that happens. You know, we often reassess after a six-month trial, and the patient really has not had any benefit in terms of symptoms of cutting down exacerbations, we stop the drug. And it may be possible to consider another drug after some sort of a washout period, which is really not solidified in guidelines, but we could consider switching to an alternative is basically what I tell the patients. Patients ask, uh, when can I start taking injections at home? Is it right as we start the drug, or is it down the road? This is mainly for injections that are available for home administrations. There are no clear guidelines. Um, I can highlight what we do in clinic. We've elected to typically start the patients in clinic for the first three to six months uh, before transitioning them to self-injections for those that are available for self-administration, of course. This allows us to gain confidence that the patient 
is not having side effects to it or a lot of local reaction. It also allows some time for us to ensure that they're appropriately educated about how to administer these drugs at home. And plus, we reassess at about four to six months uh, to see if the patient has had some improvement in their clinical condition and whether we would continue their medications long term. Should I continue to take my inhalers after the shot starts? And the answer is really yes. Having said that, if on chronic prednisone, I often tell patients to consider, you know, come up with a plan after a few doses of the biologic to consider slowly tapering off. Uh, but certainly it's important to tell the patients not to abruptly discontinue steroids. Certainly there's risk for adrenal insufficiency, but also risk that they may trigger an asthma exacerbation. Uh, but really it's important to work with their physician on coming up with an appropriate taper. So certainly some of my patients say that they're scared of needles, and we've all probably encountered such patients before. And studies show that about 20 to 30 percent of adults between the age of 20 and 40 are really scared or fearful of needles. Fear decreases as, as age increases, and needle fear and this phobia tends to be more prevalent in women compared to men. There are many patient barriers that have been identified to biologics, and I'd like to highlight some of these barriers, but also propose some of the solutions. Patients particularly who live far and away, and they must come to the clinic for administration of drugs, I think that's certainly a very valid concern that certain patients have. Uh, the time that they have to perhaps take away from work or school, as well as the scheduling requirements. And so these are, you know, to get through some of these barriers, it's important to, to know that some of these drugs are available for home administration or self-administration. Also, patient assistant programs are available. Cost is certainly a very valid barrier, and whether the drug is going to be covered by my insurance is a very common question that patients ask me, and that's, that's really true. And we'll talk about prior authorization um, in a bit number of injections and the mode of administration. Again, this is where discussion in a shared de decision-making model about what's important, subcutaneous versus IV, whether uh, every two weeks is important or every four weeks or every eight weeks is maybe the case with venralizumab after the first few doses. And so it's, it's really this discussion about understanding what patient can do and is willing to do and really meeting them to meet that expectation. So there are certainly clinical barriers uh, to the use of biologics. I'd like to propose some solutions here for those. I think prior authorizations with the insurance company is certainly a big and a valid one. And there are navigators available and assistance programs available for this. However, I'd like to leave you at the end of this presentation with some tips about how to get through those barriers. There's certainly lack of personnel, capital, or storage. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means and how you can utilize brown bagging or white bagging to your benefit or your patient's benefit, really. Uh, time to testing and counseling patients, as well as the lack of knowledge of guidelines and of side effects. Well, you all have taken the first step by attending this lecture today, as well as all of the, our echo asthma sessions to improve upon your knowledge on severe asthma and the options that are available for your patients. So I think hopefully some of the tips that we provide will help you get through some of these barriers. So there are various types of drug procure procurement methods for the biologics. I'd like to highlight a few. The buy and build method where the clinician purchases, stocks, and administers medications, and then bills under the patient's medical benefits. This, as you can imagine, can be a bit risky for the clinician who would bear the upfront cost of the drug as well as has to maintain an inventory. White bagging means that the drug is shipped by the specialty pharmacy to the clinician's office for administration for a particular patient, and then is billed by the pharmacy to the payer. So what the clinician's responsibility is to basically store the drug until it's administered to the patient. Brown bagging would mean that the patients acquire their own medications through the pharmacy benefit, and then actually bring it, walk it over to the clinician to administer. Clinicians certainly have lesser risk in this. You don't have to store uh, or manage an inventory um, and maybe less costly to patients, but patients will need to know how to store and handle the medication uh, correctly, especially for the transport. Both white and brown bagging have really significantly increased uh, over many years for omalizumab, which, was, which as you may remember was the first drug in the biologic market to be approved back in the early 2000s. So more tips on prior authorization. 
you know, certainly prior authorization or the need for it has been shown to lead to delays. In one study, there's a mean delay of about 43 days in the first dose, and about 42% of these patients required prednisone while waiting for an approval. So not only was there, was there a delay for initiation of the drug, these patients actually had an exacerbation while waiting to start the drug. And so it's really important that establishing a protocol for documentation, when you see your patient, have that shared decision-making visit, can avoid the delays, prevent denials and going back and forth, and really efficiently use your time and minimize how much time you would need. So some of the things that's really important to document in your note is, you know, what the asthma control is, you know, how are they doing? And that despite appropriately taking their inhaled corticosteroid and their other anti-inflammatory agents that they're still getting into trouble with frequent symptoms, it's important to highlight their exacerbations history. So how many exacerbations have they had in the prior 12 months that have required prednisone or steroids, that have required potentially ER visits or urgent care visits or hospitalization? So really getting into that detailed exacerbation history and then really documenting what their biomarkers are. What is that IgE level? What is that blood eosinophil level? And understanding and documenting that correctly would really go a long way for an efficient prior authorization process. That's really what the insurance company is asking. The one caveat I'd like to mention is for patients whose eosinophil levels are particularly checked when they are on prednisone, prednisone may actually mask the eosinophil levels. And so you may particularly want to document for that patient that the patient actually has a prednisone dependent asthma or that we've been unable to wean the patient off prednisone. And so it's important to consider that the eosinophils may be falsely low in these patients, but that prednisone actually benefits their asthma. There are various resources that are available for help. You know, you can check the websites for many of these drugs that have help for navigator assistance and things like that. So despite all of this, you know, why am I telling you all of this? Biologics are really underused. They're good drugs, but they really overall remain quite uncommonly used for patients in severe asthma. Again, to highlight these are step, this is step five treatment. This is add-on treatment for patients who are not controlled otherwise with inhaled corticosteroids or anti-inflammatory therapy in asthma. So it's for a small subset of patients. Having said that, even for that subset of patients, it's quite underutilized, as you can see in this study done in 2019. Thank you for listening, and we'll open this up for some question and answers. All right, some great information there from Dr. Kerr. Um, Dr. McCormick, what are our key takeaways from this lecture? Uh, patients, uh, one of the key takeaways is that the biologics are a new class, or many of them are a new class of therapies that are potentially underutilized due to some very um, common barriers, which include cost, uh, some of the logistics of getting the medications, and um, patient experience and perceptions with uh, injections, and making sure to address these barriers uh, within our practices as well as within communicate by communicating with our patients is a way to make sure that for patients for whom this is appropriate, we uh, make sure to increase the access to the extent possible. Any other comments on takeaways? I think this is a great resource for some of the patients that are doing everything that they can and yet they're still uncontrolled. They've made their home allergy and asthma friendly. You've checked their inhaler technique. You've checked compliance. You've checked all those things. And, you know, for that tiny little percentage, what is it, the uh, five to eight percent of those with asthma have the severe asthma. And so sometimes no matter what you do, they're going to end up on a biologic. So I think it's a great option. Thank you, Andrea. Do we have any questions? I wanted to share a few thoughts about dealing with injection anxiety because there people won't always be upfront and tell you, look, I'm scared to do this. There are people who don't go fishing because they're scared of being on a boat and there's 
people who don't go on a picnic because they're afraid of bees, and there are people who won't come visit you for dinner because they're frightened of dogs, but they might not tell you that. So I think uh, there have to be two things that are addressed with any injectable. This is not peculiar to just asthma, biologic injectables. But the, the first thing is the patient has to perceive a payoff. It's not at all difficult to get people to take their pain medicine because they're immediately rewarded with pain relief. It was somewhat difficult to get patients to take insulin because a lot of them didn't feel a lot better and they got more overweight and their appetite was stimulated and they were having to pay for medicine. So it was a, initially a pretty difficult battle until we convinced people, here's the payoff. I know you don't feel much different, but you're less likely to go blind. You're less likely to use your kidney, lose your kidneys. Here are the payoffs for it. And then also, I think they want to know the magnitude. Like if uh, oftentimes in situations like this, I will actually show the patient the prescribing information from the FDA that ranks how often people have uh, adverse effects and how serious they were. So that for instance, with the asthma biologics, the injection site reactions are listed as mild. They're not even listed in the category of moderate to severe. That's not true for all injections. Our newest vaccine for shingles called Shingrix, there actually has been a stratification of the intensity of the reactions because some people find the injection disabling, at least for a short time period, when they take the medicine. So what I want to suggest to colleagues is, is two things. First, remind the patient what the payoff is likely to be. How costly was it to them to have to go to the hospital? How scary was it when they had to go to the emergency room? How difficult was it when their asthma incapacitated them so they could no longer take care of the kids and they had to call their mom to take care of the kids? Don't we want to avoid that if we can by better control? Won't that be worth some investment of your time, money, or injection? Second, try to quantify what well, I know there's many people who feel anxiety about shots. We have big, strong football players and we bring them in to give them a flu shot and they fall over on the floor just because they weren't willing to admit that they felt like they were too embarrassed to talk about the fact they were afraid of getting a shot. And if we were more sensitive to say something like, many people have anxiety about getting injections. Is this an issue for you? We're gonna to try to make it as comfortable as possible. We'll have you in a chair, we are supported, whatever it takes to make them feel at home. And then lastly, we can't rely on the patient to be a scientist and just read the package insert and know how to give the shot. Most physicians, I, I can't speak for Dr. McCormick, but I, I was lucky because I did some of my training in an allergy clinic. So I got used to giving people shots, but many physicians have never given a patient a shot. They started an IV, they put in a central line, they've done intubation, but no one ever gave them instructions. I participated in a communication about Shingrix vaccine, if you actually go to the CDC's website, they tell you to do use different length needles depending about how much a person weighs. So if you take a, a very young slender girl and put a needle in her that's this long, and you take a person with a, a morbid obesity and you use a needle that's this long, well, you're not gonna necessarily get the penetration of the needle where you want. We wanna be sensitive to providing the right size needle. So dramatize the reward be realistic about what the adverse effect of the injection is, prepare them for that, make sure they don't have any anxieties about it and make sure they feel competent to use the tool because blundering through administration, wondering, well, gee, it's hard for me to give this in my arm. Could I give it in my stomach? Could I give it in my thigh? Have someone talk them through the first procedure. And the last thing is, in my experience, and I don't have proof of this for you, I, I am an always aspiring scientist, so I don't like to really say much unless I have a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled, Crosby, Stills, Nash, Young, Sears, and Roebuck trial to support it. But in my experience, so this will be in the absence of a trial data, when people are reluctant, sometimes I say to them, would you be willing to try it once? If you try it once and you say, no, it's not for me, it hurt too much, I didn't see any difference, then, then let's walk away. But I would feel remiss if I didn't encourage you to at least try once to see if this can help you. You know, I won't blame you at all if you said, why did I bother to spend that money, take that shot, endure the soreness? It didn't really help me at all. At least you gave it a trial. 
and and some, sometimes people respond to the idea because what they're afraid of and fear is a strong negative motivator, of course, is, oh, I'm going to have to take this for the rest of my life. I was, I'm afraid of shots start to start out with, if I agree to do the first one, they're going to be awful and it's going to be awful for the rest of my life. So they have an option to walk away at any time. And those tools are not just specific to asthma, but I think they are pertinent in this discussion as they are with any discussion about injectables. Do you know, what we're saying, and Dr. K, that was terrific. Um, I don't know, it, it may depend on people's insurance, but when I was on an induct injectable, they had a home healthcare nurse actually came out and trained me how to do the injections. And she sat with me and she brought two oranges and I had to practice injecting in the oranges. So um, that might be an option for some people, depending on their insurance, to have somebody actually help them through everything when they get to their home. So anything we can do to help these people. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. That's a great point. Um, any other questions or experiences from the group? Any um, tricks that you use to make this go a little smoother? All right. Thanks, everyone. And thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Yeah, excellent real world advice. I think that's very important. Okay, well, looks like it is time for us to get into our patient case. Uh, this will also be shared by Dr. McCormick. Um, wonderful. Thanks so much. Can you see my screen? If you could... Uh, we can, we can see it. If you don't mind making it just a, a touch larger for uh, the recording, that would be amazing. That's great. Awesome. Thank you and so I much. think this patient will um, dovetail nicely into our topic. And I, I completely agree. I don't think as physicians, we get uh, much training or experience clinically in giving injections. My own personal experience is more from my own personal and household experience rather than experience I've had in the office or in the hospital setting. So I thought those were all great points. So this is a patient of mine who I've been seeing for several years. She's now 60 and developed asthma at the age of seven, um, which was allergic asthma. And over time, it was noted that she also had aspirin sensitivity and nasal polyposis. So she has uh, Samter's triad. And really when I started seeing her, all of this had been diagnosed and she was already being, being managed quite well. Um, she's a never smoker. And over time she's had um, pretty notable cough that is often productive of clear phlegm, sometimes whitish. And she's an avid uh, cyclist and really enjoys exercising, exercises pretty vigorously. She and her husband both uh, cycle quite a bit. Uh, and she notes chest tightness. And when, when these symptoms of cough and, and chest discomfort uh, are, are more prominent, this also is uh, sometimes can limit her her physical activity to an extent. She has the symptoms of cough um, often and when, when they're present, they're present most days and she describes um, coughing throughout the day as well as prominent post-nasal drip and, and sinus symptoms that seem to track with the symptoms in her chest. She does have a history of allergies and um, these are seasonal in nature with the most prominent times being the spring as well as the fall. She uh, I wrote here, yeah, she had undergone skin testing a long time ago. I'll show you some of her updated RAS testing that I had ordered. And she had been on uh, allergy immunotherapy uh, for quite some time um, earlier in her life and had resumed this later. She, uh, as I mentioned, had uh, current sinus symptoms. She's quite responsive to prednisone, but doesn't like to take prednisone and hasn't taken prednisone, at least currently in the last year. She also does get relief and will use her beta agonist uh, therapy when she has an increase in, in her symptoms and particularly will use it before exercising. She uh, also notes um, triggers of cold air, but otherwise doesn't really have a lot um, of, of sensitivity to, to um, exposures that she encounters in her daily life. 
she takes uh, fluticasone salmeterol, uh, the HFA uh, formulation, two puffs twice daily, as well as Montelukast, and uses her albuterol as needed. She sometimes uses nasal sinus rinses uh, with uh, budesonide, and more recently was started on fluticasone nasal with a specific system um, called Exans. That's uh, um, a unique device that's more than just um, gives you a little bit more penetration than simply a nasal spray. Uh, when she her asthma is more active, it causes her to miss work sometimes, but she's pretty um, she pretty much powers through. So kind of minimal miss work, but really more more of an impact, I would say, with her physical activity and and really more of a impact just on her day to day. Uh, experience in terms of the, the nuisance uh, and frustration with the cough and, and the sinus symptoms. She has had surgery for nasal polyposis in the past and follows actively with her allergist. Um, and these are her, her labs. Uh, her white count is normal. She's not anemic. And her eosinophil count I measured recently was 650 and a couple years ago was 500. She also gets labs out of our system. So I just pulled two of the more, two of the ones that were within uh, the records that I have access to. Her IgE was 31 and uh, her RAST test, her RAST panel uh, demonstrated sensitization to uh, dog and cat. Uh, but didn't demonstrate some sensitization to the grasses, trees, molds, um, and pollen uh, that was, and dust mite that was tested. Her PFTs demonstrated, the most recent ones demonstrated a mild obstructive uh, defect with uh, FEV1 of 80% predicted. And I wanted to show this here because um, she's really quite, a, quite healthy, uh, as I mentioned, very active. And her PFTs, while they're normal, this was the more recent uh, value. But if you look at her FEV1 um, two years or a little less than two years prior, she uh, had had an FEV1 of, of 2.5, so 500 cc's lower than, than the most recent value. So she does have fluctuation, um, even though her numbers are within the normal range currently. So. The question I thought we could address is how would you characterize her asthma? And would this be a patient uh, for whom you would consider a biologic? And, and what are the features that um, presently and in the future you might, you might track um, to, to think about therapy for her? And I have three virtual schoolers, so sorry if there's background noise. <laughs> No, not a, not a problem. Thank you so much, Dr. Care. Sorry, thank you, Dr. McCormick. I'm so used to thanking virtual Dr. Care. <laughs> so any thoughts about this patient and how you might kind of um, put together her, her current status and, and how you might approach her treatment? I can tell you some one, let me just put one thought out there for consideration. When we think about biologics, in addition to asthma, one of the things I'm sometimes thinking about are, are there other components or features of someone's entire medical condition that may prompt us like a secondary indication uh, for a biologic that may um, maybe lean towards or, or against um, initiating therapy? Well, Dr. McCormick in hopes that there are always more than one right way to address a problem. It, I wonder about which, which issue is most burdensome either to you as the clinician or to her and her partner as a patient. Because for instance, if her main recreational activity with her partner is bicycling and that's being hampered, that could be really important. So that I, I didn't see any mention of chromalin. Now people don't talk about chromalin very much because it's an old fashioned medicine that's been around since before I think everybody on the screen was born. My classmate Hippocrates recommended it, but uh, chromalin doesn't work for everybody. And I don't know why. Uh, I remember in the very first NHLBI guidelines on asthma, they recommended a trial of chromalin in asthmatics, but acknowledged 
that only about a third of patients get a strong response. If you're one of those one third, you win. Otherwise, you should use the more traditional therapies. But because it can also be used for exercise-induced asthma, the convenience of it is you can you want to use it at shortly before the episode of exercise is possible. 10 to 15 minutes would really be about ideal. And yet, then you're going to get about an hour or two of service. Now, I don't know if this woman is doing cross-national biking or she's just doing a casual ride with her husband for a half an hour to an hour, but that might be an addition that would enable her to do some of the things she wants to do in her life that her asthma is preventing her from, from doing. So that would be a consideration of a next step I would do for her. And then also, I would wonder, you notice the guidelines are pretty clear now on giving a greener light to formoterol than any of the other beta agonists. And I've not seen a head-to-head -head trial to know whether the, the duration and its efficacy are better or just the fact that it has more rapid onset. But before, actually, before advancing her to a biologic, I would try manipulating some of those other ingredients and see if she could gain something from manipulating the, the background. Even though I know our topic is always biologic, that doesn't mean biologics is always the answer. Your thoughts on that? I love those ideas, especially, um, I think she's a, a really good uh, example of someone who might benefit from the change in the recent guidelines for use of as needed, al what used to be as needed albuterol to change that out to as needed ICS lava for those days that she's having more symptoms. I really do believe that the allergic pathway is a strong driver for her. So for those times that she's needing something more having that something more include an inhaled steroid was probably much more likely to get to her root problem. And so I think that's, um, that's a great suggestion. And chromalin, I think um, part of too, why I think it's not quite used as much as it wasn't available for a while. And so we're sort of looking at a re, re uptake of chromalin, but I agree that particularly given her exercise profile, thinking about that as another strategy um, is a great suggestion. I want to make sure that one economic issue does not stand in the way of patient benefit. When the first combination steroid and LABA came out, a lot of clinicians raised an uproar because you could buy El Cheapo Salmeterol for a little bit and El Cheapo Fluticasone, and they said, well, why do, we, do you expect us to buy your expensive product when we can just do them sequentially? And it was actually demonstrated that the efficacy for bronchodilation is maximized when beta agonist and steroid are at the same receptor at the same time. And they did a study where they took radio labeled fluticasone, let's say carbon 131, and you took a hit of that. And then they watched which alveoli lit up with carbon 131. So you took the fluticasone and you get alveolus number 12, 15, 17, 97, and 132. Then you took a carbon labeled 132 cell meterol, and you took a hit of that. Unfortunately, it didn't go to all the same alveoli because with each breath, you open and close because the surfactant doesn't open all the alveoli to the same degree with each breath. And they actually proved you are getting more than your money's worth by making sure that both of those chemicals are in the same inhalant at the same time and arrive at the same alveoli to do their maximum job. So I wanna make sure patients who are up against it because of COVID and loss of jobs and because of just the expensive medicines aren't trying to follow your direction saying, yes, I am taking a long acting beta agonist and a steroid, but meanwhile, we didn't know they were doing the, the, the individual versions and not doing the combined. So there's one other feature about her care. About a year or so ago, um, she, she had mentioned that she had come back from her ENT and they had talked about being more aggressive with her nasal steroids because what they had seen on exam. Um, and her last, uh, she had a surgery in 2016. And my sense was maybe there was um, a sense that she would be headed for more surgery in the future. And so I reached out to her ENT just to say, you know, I'm not sure what you're seeing. Do you think we should think about a biologic somewhere along the line? 
I completely agree that for, but for that, um, I think she's not someone I would clearly typically reach for a biologic for um, because there one, there are other strategies. And then um, two, I th she's doing pretty well. She's not someone who's in the hospital. She's not um, she actually doesn't uh, take prednisone. I think if she took prednisone, it would probably, it would make her symptoms go away, or at least that's historically what's happened. But, um, you know, I, there are lots of reasons we don't want her to be taking frequent prednisone and she's able to, to get by without it and so forth. Um, but my sense uh, over the last year or so is that her symptoms are getting more prominent. And from communicating with her uh, otolaryngologist that the nasal polyps may be kind of back um, headed towards somewhere where she will need an intervention. My conversation with the ENT, you know, he was sort of like, well, we can always do another surgery. It's a straightforward surgery and so forth. Being a non-surgeon, I was more inclined to say, well, if there's a medication we could use that would also give you another benefit and spare a surgery, that seems pretty appealing. And that was about a year or so ago. When I saw her um, in January, her symptoms were much more prominent. And she said that she was feeling like she's been much less active and it felt like it was a little bit subtle, but when we were talking, she said, well, maybe, you know, this probably is part of what's, there are a lot of things in the world this year that are making us less active, but she felt probably more dissatisfied uh, with, with her symptoms. And so uh, I said, well, you would, I think she would qualify in, on paper. And I think that there's potentially a second benefit that we could consider uh, biologic and, um, and she's also engaged with her allergist and, and had been working on strategies there. So she sees an allergist, she sees me and she sees her ENT. Um, and then when, she, when we started talking about it, she has a real fear and, of needles and really the idea of any injection, even in the home environment was very, very overwhelming. So um, that was something that I didn't even really pick up on until the end of our conversation. It wasn't something that I had addressed really head on um, as part of the therapy, my, my intuition had been that she was more worried about being on like the, the category of an injectable medicine, like something that was that severe or something that was, you know, um, kind of that level that would indicate that her asthma was that, that, um, in, that severe. But I think a bigger part of it was the idea of just the needle. Um, and so we had, a, she met with our nurses and they just kind of talked it through and they did a teaching activity, not for the idea of giving her um, the therapy that day, but for more the idea of, so that she would understand what was involved um, and, you know, understand like what the needle would look like and where it would be injected and how, and what that procedure would be, would entail just um, more for the idea, not necessarily to per persuade her to do it uh, so much, but just so that she would have all of the information to make an informed choice, either today or, or in the future. And thank you, Lisa. Um, Lisa adds in the chat that <clears throat> to go back to our chromalin discussion, that she used chromalin more routinely for allergic asthma in the past, but found that um, pulmonologists uh, that she, who she worked with were, weren't as big of fans um, and that she understands that the number of doses are a downside, maybe there's a place for it. Um, considering it at EPR4 recommended PRN ICS LABA. One of the nice things about the data on dupilumab yeah. is that yeah. people get a pretty prompt response. There was a publication in 2016, specifically looking at patients with nasal polyps who had not responded to nasal steroids. And that's a tougher group because you have a somewhat resistant group there to start with. And within four weeks time, there was already a measurable improvement in symptoms and an actual polyp size and in nasal flow. You know, I actually wish in all trials that people earlier time to, to look at the results. Not that the result has to be positive, but I'd like to be able to say to a patient, all right, well, there was a statistically significant result by a month, that's great. And some people even tell us they feel better within two weeks time after starting. And, and those encouraging signs, I think, help people to, to be adherent to, to a medicine. So I, I find that encouraging as a reason to consider dupilumab in that particular case.
I should mention also that the fact that her, when I saw her in January, that her symptoms, and she's really not someone who, who complains much at all, that she had a, a, was pretty descriptive about the impact of her symptoms, but then also her lung function, even though it was normal, her FEV1 was down by 500 cc's since the prior time I had seen her. And so I felt like there was some objective data there that things had, um, that supported her, her clinical response. And then the fact that the nasal polyps seemed to be um, something that was requiring more, more attention. Um, and, and so, th so those were some of the reasons that I thought, and um, dupilumab, the indications were moderate to severe, um, and then th with the co-indication of, of nasal polyposis. I thought that, that whole picture might um, set up someone who would benefit uh, from that therapy. So. Oh, I'm responding to the question in the chat. Thanks, Dr. McCormick. Do we have any other questions from, from the group about this patient? I had a question for Dr. McCormick or others online who might know the answer to this. I've not seen a predictable course of asthma related to menopause. I believe you said your patient was 60. And had she achieved menopause of about a typical age in, in their 50s? No. So is there, do, do you see anything predictable about asthma as related to menopause? Yes, there's actually a study. Um, I'll see if I can find it quickly, but it shows that uh, women in menopause have uh, four times the death rate of any other category um, and frequently are frequent flyers in the emergency room as well. So. Um, unfortunately, it really does hit those of us that <laughs> have been in menopause or gone through it. So those, you know, those hormones. Um, also with that, even with people when um, they're menstruating that time of the month, they also have problems with their asthma typically. So um, I'll see if I can find that. The trouble with menopause is even though there's a, a mean duration of two to three years for like 60 some, I don't know the exact percent, but there's a majority of women. There's some women who experience estrogen withdrawal symptoms for a decade. And so if, if asthma is impacted, uh, it did, even in this woman, depending upon when she was menopausal, that could be associated even with her, her hormonal status. And I remember that you had mentioned that at one of our prior sessions as well. And when I was looking through and thinking about cases to present, um, this was one patient, but, but I do think some of my more active patients are, are women, you know, around this age. And I think in practice that really, um, it, it meets, um, what we know about prevalence and morbidity data as well. Um, so that this is a, a time where we see more active, more, um, more asthma for women and, uh, the, the sex gender flips from childhood to adulthood and then is enhanced. Um, in the perimenopausal and postmenopausal, immediate postmenopausal period, and that we do see more active. And I think there are probably a lot of reasons for that. Um, hormonal being one, and, and maybe um, potentially maybe some of the other stress and, and um, related uh, events. All righty, if we have no more questions, um, Dr. McCormick, would you like to summarize? Sure. Um, I think this was a, this case fit, um, this was a case of a woman who had uh, Samter's triad, so asthma, nasal polyposis, and aspirin sensitivity. She really had more moderate um, to severe asthma uh, profile with uh, active uh, sinus as well as airways um, uh, manifestations. And I think she's someone that we would consider biologic therapy for either at present or in the future. Um, given her uh, eosinophilia, which was of 500 over the 150 or 300 threshold that um, the current available uh, regimens are, are indicated for. But she's someone that as we're um, approaching treatment, we will wanna apply, um, address some of the um, concerns that were highlighted uh, in the first half hour in the video, including um, self-management, with uh, injections and some of those uh, hurdles and making sure education and communication are in place um, before uh, 
instituting that therapy. Thank you, Dr. McCormick. All right, any other questions before we get to our post-test? Okay, all right, well, let's scoot on to our final post-test polling session. And now for our knowledge questions. Question one, which of the following is not available for subcutaneous injection in the United States? Benralizumab, mepolizumab, omelizumab, dipilumab, or reslizumab? And question two, white bagging is a method of medication procurement in which the pharmacy delivers the medication directly to the patient who brings it into the office for administration. True or false? All right, Dr. McCormick, how did we do? Great. So the first question, six, almost 70% of the group uh, got the question right, which is reslizumab is the formulation that's only available IV, so it's not available for subcutaneous injection, um, and all of the others are. And um, with the exception of omelizumab, all the others are available for home um, injection as well. For the second question, this was a hard one, white bagging. Um, and the other method is brown bagging. So if we were to compare white bagging to brown bagging, um, this question actually describes brown bagging. So white bagging would be when the delivery goes right to the clinician's office and then the patient comes in for the injection and brown bagging would be kind of like the patient brown bags it from their house, they get it delivered from their house, they carry it to the doctor's office and then the doctor uh, or their staff um, administers it there. So kind of a, a, a tricky distinction there. Thank you, Dr. McCormick. Yeah, that is a tricky one. <laughs> all right, well, thank you everyone for answering all of those. And uh, just wanna say thank you all. I, this is the last time, uh, our last session, and I, you, you won't hear me ask if anyone has a patient case for next week. <laughs> Um, but I just want to say thank you all so much for your attendance on these, for your wonderful discussion. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, we're so happy to have all of you here. Please, if you have any questions, um, we're still here. Echo Asthma Boot Camp is still running through the end of the summer. Um, so please feel free to re reach out to us. Um, and uh, thank you all so much for joining us. One last echo clap. Thanks, everyone.